Welcome to STEM Talk. 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 Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is a man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Great to be here. Our guest today is one of the nation's foremost experts on prostate cancer, Dr. Christopher Logothetis. Chris has spent close to 50 years at MD Anderson in Houston, developing therapies for prostate cancer as well as other cancers, and conducting research into the underlying biology of the disease. So aside from skin cancers, prostate cancer is the most common cancer among men, claiming a man's life every 15 minutes in the United States, according to the Prostate Cancer Foundation. And since the 1970s, when Chris joined the staff at MD Anderson, which is among the nation's top-ranked hospitals for cancer care, he has been dedicated to the treatment, research, and prevention of genitourinary cancers, such as bladder, kidney, testes, and penis cancer. For the past 25 years, he has focused primarily on prostate cancer and the development of effective chemotherapy treatments. So today, Chris is the director of MD Anderson's Genital Urinary Cancer Center and is also the director of the Prostate Cancer Research Program. He is the Roy M. and Phyllis Go Huffington Distinguished Chair in Clinical Research in Urologic Oncology. And from 1993 to 2019, he was the chair of the Department of Genital Urinary Medical Oncology. But before Ken and I get to our interview with Chris, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we're especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker Henry I. The review is titled, Wide World of Science, and it reads, This podcast keeps getting better and better. The Josh Turknet episode was particularly good. I especially enjoy the often accidental ways people get into science, whether it's from watching the Apollo missions or working on a science project in middle school, or something that a professor says in college. For me, STEM Talk is a reminder to keep your mind open. Well, thank you, Henry I, and thank you to all of our other STEM Talk listeners who've helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Dr. Christopher Logothetis. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Talk. STEM STEM Talk. Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining us today is Dr. Christopher Lagothetis. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's a privilege. And also joining us is Dr. Ken Ford. Hello, Don, and hello, Chris. So, Chris, I see that you went to medical school in Greece. Did you grow up there? No, actually, my father was in the U.S. military, and I was born on a base in Germany. But he was an old-timer and attached to Greece, and we would go there every summer and eventually went to medical school there. So as a kid, when did you become interested in science? Do you remember that? I remember when I became confident that this was a direction that I was interested in. And it was in part, I think, my failure as an athlete. I tried so hard, but I was so incompetent that I was searching for something better. And somehow... My skills seem to be aligned with that, and it grew after that. It makes perfect sense. Was there a teacher or class or maybe something else that prompted your decision to go into medicine? Well, in science, it was my junior high physics teacher, Dr. Abramo, I remember him well, who knew how to animate um, physics in a way that it made sense and beyond just the numbers, the, the, the data talked. And then I had two uncles who were physicians, and I somehow they took me under their wing, and it grew from there. So what led you to attend the University of Athens School of Medicine back in the 70s? Yeah, so um, there was a strong sense on my father's part. He had lived uh, World War II. He had lived the occupation. He had lived, you know, the war in the U.S. Army. And Greece was a very, very vulnerable spot after that. 
and he felt a tremendous amount of loyalty to there, insisted we go back and contribute, and somehow it grew from there, and it became a natural spot when I got into medical school there. So back in the 60s and 70s, people would often talk about cancer in hushed tones. It was almost as if it were taboo. Can you talk about the stigma that surrounded cancer for so long? Oh, absolutely. So it was this sinister disease that would creep up from within without any known pathogen like a bacterial infection, and it would become an alien that came into the house, and somehow this was perceived by many people as being some evidence of a life not well lived. And the other thing, it was so fearful that people didn't, didn't discuss that. And um, they would call it TB if it were in the lung. They would call it anything other than cancer. Uh, it, it, was a different, it was a different time. Absolutely. Uh, I remember that time. When you started medical school in Athens, uh, were you at the time thinking about specializing in cancer, or is that something that sort of developed uh, later? It actually did develop in medical school. There was this inspiring uh, professor who came from the then sort of leaders of, of U.S. hematology and worldwide hematology. It was this guy named Damachek. And one of his disciples was, uh, who became a professor in, at the University of Athens, who somehow again took me under my wing and taught me all about replicating cells and, and all the problems that existed there. And some of the first anti-proliferative drugs came out after nitrogen, mustard, and the like. And the world seemed to open up. And I remember this mimeographed handbook from the NIH that described how to give these drugs. And, and we used to carry that around and keep it protected. Um, it, was, it was just a fascinating time. But it, when seeing these cells, you know, and, and lymph nodes disappear with these drugs, it was like, you know, suddenly light shined on a dark and thorny path before that. You can imagine. So you graduated from medical school in 1974 and then took off for Chicago, where you had an internship at Cook County Hospital. I'm just guessing that that must have been quite a culture shock to go from Athens, Greece to Chicago back in the 1970s. Is that right? Correct. Oh, it was, it was first of all, you know, Cook County Hospital was one of the premier hospitals then. It was sort of the war zone in the south side of Chicago, learning trauma, learning how to deal with social problems. Heroin addiction became there. The Rainbow Coalition with Jesse Jackson was involved there. It was a tumultuous time. But somehow, many of us who were there anchored our future in medicine, believing that it could contribute. And it was one of the most formative events in my life. And, and I learned how to become sort of an independent physician and learned how to think when not quite awake. Mm. I can see how that experience had to be something that um, shaped, to some extent, your future life. H how did you decide to go there, though? What, in other words, what yeah. attracted you to that place? There was a book that was out then called The House of God, which was sort of um, an interesting uh, book that was written by um, Cook County interns and residents, which would describe all these ways and the, and the, and the reality of treating patients at that time. And it somehow appealed to me in some combination of sort of the frontier of medicine in a setting where everything wasn't sterile and organized. Somehow that appealed to me. I can imagine. Yes, that's really interesting, Chris. A number of my postdoc advisors when I was at Duke University School of Medicine recommended that book, and I definitely took a read. It was definitely an interesting book, so I could see how it influenced you. So, Chris, what then took you to Texas and MD Anderson specifically? I had I had become convinced that that sort of first of all, oncology at that time was not a desired subspecialty. There still weren't enough people who thought it was hopeful, but it it had really inspired me, and it was the most open-minded, entrepreneurial, and as we were talking just earlier with with Ken the place where the rules of science were based on science, not some dogma of how things needed to be done. It was a very, it was the frontier for linking patient care to science. And that really appealed to me. After you finished your fellowship, you joined the faculty at MD Anderson. And, and we're just guessing that you must certainly like it there because you're coming up on your 50th anniversary. Is that correct? That's correct. It's a wonderful thing. It's uh, rare these days. It really is. It is. Chris, you often talk about the need to understand the drivers of cancer. 
Can you talk a little bit about this and what do we know about the drivers of cancer and do different cancers have different drivers? Like what, what can we say about that? Yeah. So at the core of the question is that in order to effectively treat patients and anticipate the emergence of cancer, we have to understand those nodes or those central events that initiate the cascade of events that that this disease becomes a real malignancy. Now, that sounds trivial because it was simple. The oncogene story and the Nobel Prizes came up early in my career, and the idea was that somehow this was purely a genetic disease. We now know that simplistic view was the start of a long path forward where we know that epigenetic changes, changes corresponding changes in the proteome driven by the environment, converge on a set of events that drive this illness. So our simplistic view of a driver being a single molecular event is simply not true. It's a cascade of events that actually develop the flavor of these diseases. And why so much of our science needs to change and our approach to deal with all these data to find these nodes The optimistic point of the drivers, the point I want to make is that, is that experience matters. That means there aren't an infinite number of possibilities, because if experience didn't matter on the outcomes, every patient would be new to us every day, yet we're very good at recognizing passive progression and selecting therapy, suggesting that there's a finite number of tractable events that drive this disease, that if we can apply our knowledge and find them, we'll get much more efficient. And I think that's shifting, as we discussed earlier with Ken, from randomized trials to mechanism-based focuses to try to find these nodes that are a finite number of events, otherwise experience wouldn't matter, is how I think Mm. we need to redefine drivers. Absolutely. And as Don knows, uh, you're you're singing my song there. The RCT is a wonderful mechanism for many things, but it's become often a substitute for thinking. Correct. Yeah. So as the science in medicine and our understanding of the milestones in the development of cancer have improved, this time frame sort of coincided with the Human Genome Project and lots of breakthroughs in that regard with respect to the genome. How do those connect and do they connect? And has there been a benefit from the Human Genome Project to cancer treatment? Unquestionably. And and those people at the Broad Institute who understood that much of the language of cancer development was mathematics invested in sequencing and math and analyzing these data. And they've, of course, led the understanding of genetics and human disease, including cancer. But now it's it's the biggest product of this, think about it as as letters in an alphabet. And now we're getting sentences in paragraphs. We're understanding the proteome, the epigenome that followed this. On the recent cover of Nature was the horse genome. And you can say, how does that relate to human cancer? And the answer is developmental biology and cross-species, you know, comparative uh, developmental biology is going to be very important because certain species get certain diseases and others don't. So you could imagine that these byproducts of the Human Genome Project, this big science, give us a glimpse, still superficial, of the events that affect different species and understanding those differences, apply them to human cancer biology and other diseases in this comparative biology will be huge. So I think as we're all becoming more comparative biologies and developmental biologists, our big crutch and our direction is all these products of, of the Human Genome Project. So, Chris, along with these new technologies, there evolved a strategy of what is called co-clinical investigation. And this is where researchers study the mouse, but in parallel look at the differences and similarities with humans. And that integrated data required a language to bring it all together, which is now known as Prometheus. So can you talk a little bit about how this has led to an acceleration of our understanding of the biology of cancer? Yeah. So... When the NIH started saying, we need models of human disease, everybody went about the business appropriately so, and it's contributed a lot of doing genetic models, developing patient-derived xenografts, under the assumption that you could model in a different species precisely what happens in humans. And the question arises is, can that happen? And in part, many of the mechanisms certainly so. But for example, steroid hormones are central to prostate cancer. We study mice. Cortisol doesn't exist in mouse bone at the same concentration exists in humans. So it's a very different disease by necessity. So we've evolved 
to trying to understand precisely the nature of mouse disease, even when a human cancer is engrafted in it, and living on those differences to get the mechanism that implies in human. It's the similarities plus the differences that, that, that provide us information. So FGF and the steroid metabolome are very different in mouse and man. Bridging these differences allows us to understand the differences in the phenotype in mouse and man and build on these. If we do them concurrently and we understand the language of the, the mouse biology and the human biology and don't let this babble go on in between where it's an issue of describing it wrong, we can leverage those differences. We can't biopsy humans serially like we can do mouse. We're getting better with liquid biopsies as doing that. But we can, if we do the concurrent mouse model and human model, to bring these together. So Prometheus is a program that we've developed internally in our program to codify the mouse observations with as close as we can get to the corresponding human observations and allow them to be integrated. And we have a number of publications where on one table, what we set out to do years ago there's both mouse and human data, and if you isolated the data into two different silos, you would come to a different conclusion. And actually integrating together and pointing out the differences allows you to link mechanism to the human phenotype. And that's been around FGF and, and vascularity of, of disease in bone, where mouse and man had some similarities and differences, and understanding them was informative. And creating the framework that allowed you to look across species was critical. Mm, that's fascinating, and I can see the benefit of that. Chris, the bio on your website says that you've studied a range of genitourinary cancers throughout your career. And these include cancers such as germ cell tumors, bladder tumors, and renal cancers. And more recently, you became interested in prostate cancer. So we're curious, what led to your interest specifically in prostate cancer? Yeah, so, again, I think I have this natural tendency to go where there's a desert of intellectual ideas as other people sort of pick up the other pieces. And when I started prostate cancer, almost 50, the focus on it 15, 20 years ago, people were saying, why do you want to go there? It's, it's a disease of elderly men. They can't tolerate therapy. They do well anyway, and they die of something else. And, of course, it was obvious when you're in the clinic that all those dogmas were completely wrong. The other feature of prostate cancer, it seemed to be unique among malignancies. And there is a scientist called Leonard Weiss, who was a pathologist at Roswell Park, and he developed this theory that is underappreciated called the cascade theory of metastases. And basically what he said is, all cancers have access to blood, but they only grow in single sites. And some cancers require an interaction with a remote microenvironment in order to develop the property of lethality. And there were a couple of poster childs for that disease. One of them was prostate cancer in bone. So in order for it to become lethal, the cancer cell had to interact with bone in a way that it then gained properties to go to other sites. So one need to rethink the cancer that went to bone as a new malignancy that acquired properties in this distant site that allowed it to grow. And it was a two-compartment model that he proposed that there were properties of the cancer and there were properties of the, the bone that actually had to interact. And I gave a talk at Walter Reed at one time, and one of the disciples of Hudgens was there, and he came up to me and said, you know, you're the only one who says this. There were, there were four publications, I can't remember, the, the, of the Nobel Prize winner for, for the hormone. And the one that everybody ignores is when he put the rat tail subcutaneously. That's when prostate cancer grew in the rat tail, which was bone. And there was something unique to the bone providing growth factors that were there. And that was sort of the impetus that gave me confidence to pursue this. Really interesting. So metastatic cancer was first cured in 1956 when methotrexate was used to treat a rare tumor that's called choriocarcinoma. And since then, chemotherapy drugs have been used to treat mixed germ cell tumors and have led to dramatically improved survivorship among patients with metastatic germ cell tumors. So back in 1982, you had a paper in the journal Cancer titled The Growing Teratoma Syndrome. So at the time, tumor growth following chemotherapy for mixed germ cell tumors had been considered a reliable indicator of persistent active carcinoma. 
And the rule is that if the cancer wasn't responding, you didn't operate because the operation was futile. In this 1982 paper, however, you demonstrated that you could alter a tumor with chemotherapy in such a way that surgery would, could now cure it, where previously it couldn't. Could you please elaborate on this paper? Yeah. So the dogma that existed prior to this in other papers, I don't want to take full credit for this, was that chemotherapy worked as an anti-proliferative therapy alone, meaning it killed rapidly growing cells. And there were these maps that looked like the periodic table. So you have highest responses in rapidly growing tumors like choriocarcinoma and brinal carcinomas and the like, and colon cancers and the like would never benefit from chemotherapy because they were slow growing. So, so there was this map that we all believed. And, and it suggested a binary um, outcome to, to, to um, either you were rapidly proliferating and you benefited and you went to zero, or you were, had a cancer that was entirely resistant. At some intellectual level, it made no sense because the data showed that chemotherapy killing as an anti-proliferative drug was log kill. So by definition, if it was log kill, it would be an asymptotic curve and you would never get to zero, so nobody should be cured and yet people were being cured. So there was a search at that time to understand this, and all sorts of reasoning without data to support it, you get it low enough that the immune surveillance can now take care of it. Well, you know, it didn't work on the going up phase. Why would it work on the going down phase? There was all sorts of hand-wringing and hand-waving to justify why anti-proliferative drugs could cure. And one of them that, that led us to, to think about this thing, particularly in the context of germ cell tumors, because if you count up the cure rates, they were disproportionate to the survival rates. More people were surviving than chemotherapy alone would cure, and it asked the question, why? And one of the reasons may be that the chemotherapy altered the cancer in such a manner that therapies before, which could not result in cure, now exploited this new acquired vulnerability induced by the chemotherapy to improve the outcome. And fortunately, the morphology at that time, the light microscope was very informative, and we could see residual teratoma, and we could see expanding rather than invading tumors that led us to operate on these patients, and they were cured in a setting where previously they wouldn't be. So the dogma, the strongly held dogma that it only worked as anti-proliferative therapy was questioned with these studies. The dogma that every growth in cancer was equivalent and indicated resistance as before exposure to chemotherapy was challenged and actually deposed. And a treatment strategy as opposed to a drug development strategy took over in germ cell tumors that account for the differences in the cure rates, which would be accounted for with chemotherapy alone rather than the treatment strategy that include thoughtful integration of surgery and radiation when these new vulnerabilities came there. So it initiated the cascade of events that are challenging the dogma that you only find an advance in, in randomized clinical trials of drug A versus drug B, and you don't study the more complex treatment strategies which contribute to the improved outcomes of diseases. So it was the formative event for me to rethink our, our strategies for developing therapies. Hmm. Really amazing. You published a, uh, another paper where you described the spiral diagram of cancer progression, where, in a sense, the cancer sends a message to the host, and the host sends a message back, and you get this sort of cycle that becomes almost a circle over time. And it was a beautiful paper, and you wrote about how this interaction between the cancer and the patient eventually evolves into the patient becoming, and this is an unfortunate use of the word, but in a sense, complicit to the cancer's growth. Can you talk about this spiral of cancer progression and, uh, and, and just, it was, a, it was a really nice paper. Oh, thank you. Um, so the way we thought about it, you know, the, the development of of metastases and the sort of new appreciation for the microenvironment in contributing to this led into these concepts of this vicious cycle, where there would be an in, uh, a vector of of change remodeling the microenvironment by the cancer to the to the specific microenvironment, and in turn a response that would result in this self perpetuating cycle. The problem with that concept, it didn't include the, the concept of time, how these evolve over time. So it implied a static event at one time, and it was circular. And if you thought of time, you had to include this notion of a spiral that progresses over time. So it allowed us to incorporate the dimension of time. 
And this became critical because the adaptive cycle, the next cycle, the next turn, had a next set of limiting events, a next set of limiting events. And when you thought of the temporal heterogeneity of the cancer, the cycle that was important at that specific time was the one that you needed to intervene with. So instead of a static cycle, we wanted to bring in this notion of time. And over time, there's an evolution where the tumor-associated microenvironment, which is a host contribution to the cancer, and we helped develop with these co-clinical trials because we could do species-specific interrogation of human cancers in mice, we could see what the mouse contributed to and what the human contributed to. And we developed this notion that the environment was progressively more involved, the remodeling environment, in supporting cancer growth, in essence, becoming complicit. Again, the model being prostate cancer, where an endocrine concentration of male hormones drive the established disease, it shifts over time to a paracrine and autocrine steroid hormone profile that in turn remodels the bone, and over time, you get this set of cascade of events. So the spiral model was designed to include the dimension of time and how it evolves. The problem is we didn't have the technology like we're now acquiring to monitor time in cancers, and these liquid biopsies are allowing it to do it. And now, especially with the exosomes, being methods for transferring genetic material within cells, we have the possibility that we're looking at is cell-specific exosomes to understand what genetic material is packaged and sent to each cancer cell, and that's our aspirational goal for the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's a big challenge, too. That's a big challenge. <laughs> what that's, you just laid out is uh, a that's big, a big endeavor. Challenge. It's, 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 but uh, somebody will inherit it. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. So spring of 2021, you published a paper in clinical cancer research that was titled Radium-223 Treatment Increases Immune Checkpoint Expression in Extracellular Vesicles from the Metastatic Prostate Cancer Bone Microenvironment. And Radium-223 is a radiopharmaceutical that's used to treat metastatic cancers in the bone. And bone-targeting radiotherapy with Radium-223 has been shown to prolong the survival of patients with metastatic prostate cancer. The clinical response to radium-223, however, is often followed by detrimental relapse and also potentially progression, and this is something that has confounded researchers over the years. But in this paper, you identified a treatment that could potentially increase the effectiveness of radium-223. Is that correct? Correct. Well, thanks for bringing that paper up. So radium-223 is, you know, radium is next to calcium on the periodic table. It's an alpha emitter, therefore it penetrates very superficially into adjacent tissues. And one characteristic of radium effect on human disease is it prolongs survival without proportionally affecting PSA, but it affects alkaline phosphatase. So PSA is the marker of the epithelial compartment of the cancer, whereas alkaline phosphatase was a marker of the microenvironment. It's it's an enzyme from osteoblasts. So we reasoned that radium-223 was actually acting on the osteoblast principally and the immediately adjacent cells. It also does not cause myelosuppression proportional to other beta emitters, and there are cancer cells diffusely in the marrow, so it didn't radiate the bulk of cancer cells, yet it prolonged survival. That led to two concepts. One is this was a microenvironment-targeting drug, And it was also targeting a subset of the cancer cells that may not be represented in PSA in the blood that account for the lethality of this disease. The second issue is that understanding that bone is part of the immune environment that exists in, and the bone needs to maintain a repertoire of cells to serve that goal, we reasoned that we would alter with radium-223, other components of the remodeled environment, which may create new vulnerabilities to strengthen that. Hmm. So we developed a strategy of targeting the epithelial compartment plus the microenvironment based on those observations, 
and also dealing with the complexity of the microenvironment, and could we consider using immune checkpoint blockade if we had altered it, or strategies which we hope to develop to block the transmission of genetic material in a heterotypic or homotypic cell-cell interaction between the cancer cell and the host, the reverse, or between cancer cells that would disrupt this whole society of cancer that was developed within bone over time, turning it into a chronic disease in bone and managing it a little more like arthritis was the long-term aspirational goal. And there's evidence to suggest that that's really happening. Hmm. That's wild. You mentioned PSA, and there, there's developed some controversy about its utility as a screen. Yeah. And one hears about this all the time in the lay media. Do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, so there are large randomized trials that show that PSA screening used unwisely is no benefit, and screen-detected prostate cancer patients who are then go on to be randomized, a significant portion of them, to surgery or observation do the same, suggesting that the concept of PSA as a reliable marker alone is careful. We need to, to rethink. It clearly drove excess interventions based on the paradigm that the earlier you catch a cancer, that it would do benefit. And that, for many reasons, has turned out not to be correct. So we need to think of PSA screening as a smoke detector. So I'm not one or the other. Ignoring PSA, I think, is flawed. But the algorithm of PSA elevated biopsy, surgery, or radiation is clearly wrong. PSA elevated, think, maybe get a biopsy, consider an intervention, turns out to be useful, just like a smoke detector would be in a house. So distinguish it from a smoke detector and a fire alarm. When it's used as a fire alarm, it causes excess intervention. When used as a smoke detector, it allows you to to look closely, anticipate, and sort of engage the patient in defining where the risk is and how to monitor. That's a very time-consuming, challenging discussion in an environment where the reflex remains cancer intervention. Mm -hmm. As a screen, early on as a screen, is a slightly elevated value more alarming? Or it would strike me that the rate of change, you know, if you have, you mentioned time earlier. And if you have a, a patient that you've seen over the years and you have a history with this person, and if there's a rapid rate of change, would that have a stronger implication? Or is that also not a very strong indicator? Oh, monitoring PSA and monitoring the rate of change or doubling times seems to be very informative. Oh. Now, extreme changes from 1 to 100, to be exam, usually mean inflammation or something mm-hmm. else happening. But sort of progressive linear rises are worthy of close attention, mm-hmm. and the rate of change over time is a very important predictor of the aggressiveness of the cancer. Mm-hmm. So, so that's why Serial PSAs are more valuable than single PSA concentrations are less likely to be flawed. But even there, because increases in PSA can happen from benign prostatic enlargement, and they are age-dependent, there are basically three categories of patients with an elevated PSA. Those that are healthy, meaning their PSA and their biological clock are rising at the same pace. So the day they have a heart attack is the day they develop aggressive cancer, and you don't need to worry about that. Those are healthy patients where it's aligned. There's the patient who is getting multiple comorbidities over time, and even though the PSA is rising, they are more threatened by associated events, and they are an unhealthy patient and not a cancer patient. And there's the minority of patients with early disease where the PSA and the underlying cancer is growing at a pace that accelerates or is beyond the pace of their otherwise healthy, and those are cancer patients. So distinguishing between these three categories is the key issue, and that's why we need to integrate data of patient health and the prostate and look for these alignments or misalignments so we don't focus on the cancer and refocus on the patient. Mm. Makes perfect sense. Intuitive sense, actually, when you describe it that way. Oh, it's, it's, it's sort of obvious and yet hard to communicate. 
So let's talk about another one of your papers, which we found fascinating. It appeared in the Journal of Cell Science and Therapy. And in this paper, you wrote, and this is a quote, when we aspire to cure cancer, we need to search no further than a curable cancer, such as germ cell tumor of the testes, also known as TGCT. So you point out, after all, that a germ cell is a primordial stem cell. Can you talk about this paper and also how TGCT provides us invaluable lessons about potentially curing other intractable solid tumors. Yeah. So so the, the, the key distinguishing feature and the luxury we were provided with based on the foundational work of Dixon, Moore, and Friedman before that is the morphology of the germ cell, the phenotype. When you looked at the cancer, you would find teratoma, choriocarcinoma, embryonal carcinoma, yolk sac tumors in this whole. And each of them had a very specific clinical behavior. Embryonal cell carcinomas were highly metastatic, choriocarcinomas highly metastatic, yolk sac tumors and teratomas much more indolent, and seminomas, which was a part, was highly predictable metastatic spread and responded to radiotherapy remarkably well. So this morphology revealed the secrets of this cancer. So when we detected a seminoma, a germ cell tumor, we knew precisely where it would go and precisely what therapy it needed. So we could tell by the the initial studies and before CAT scans, this was remarkable work, we radiated based on the autopsy series done at Walter Reed at that time by Dixon and Moore. We radiated the retroperitoneum of men who had, you know, that were in the military at that time because there was a draft who we didn't even have evidence of detecting, anticipating where it went. And we went to overwhelming cure rates because the secrets of the cancer were revealed by examining the primary. And the heterogeneity within those tumors were there. So imagine what power it took. It took convincing a young man just with an orchiectomy, without any visible evidence of disease, after the atomic bomb and all the bad things that were happening with with radiation were noted, to say, we can cure you if we give you this potentially toxic therapy to this specific site after surgery, and it will never come back. And it turned out to be true. And the person who taught us that was Friedman, who was actually a pathologist and a biologist who said, everywhere you guys radiate, I never find seminoma, which he called germinoma then. And the germinomas go to the retroperitoneum. Wake up and radiate the retroperitoneum. Wow. It took that kind of inspiration. So those lessons are, are across all the, the, the subtypes then and was the critical bit of knowledge that armed us with applying then was curative therapies in the right context and in the wrong context were gratuitous toxicity. Hmm. Well, you, you and your colleagues at MD Anderson and at the School of Medicine at the University of Thessaly in Greece pinned an opinion piece that ran in European Urology Journal that was titled Prostate Cancer Quo Vadis. And the article really stressed the utility measures are urgently needed for the clinical application of new diagnostics to reduce excessive intervention, as we've earlier discussed. Can you give us some background on that piece and describe the type of diagnostics that you and your colleagues were envisioning as having great utility? Yeah. So what we wanted to describe is the distinction between precision of a tool and utility of the tool. And this distinction fails to be communicated well. So the earlier you find things, the assumption is it's better. But unless that precision is matched with understanding the meaning of that observation, which is the biology, if I find it, for example, 10 years earlier, does it make a difference or have we increased the pool of patients that are subjected to intervention when now with this new very sensitive test, we're detecting diseases way in advance. Some could argue that would lead to anticipatory medicine, but maybe so far in advance in a much more heterogeneous group that many of those patients do well despite us, the phenomenon of PSA in prostate cancer. So what we asked for and what we wanted to create awareness of is that precision alone and increased accuracy without understanding meaning and potential benefit was the critical bridge that needed to be crossed between the development of these technologies, and applying these technologies. And that's a complex filter because of the the extraordinary pressure to to apply these early on with the reasoning, the more we see it, the better, which in some setting, of course, is true. 
but it's proven to be harmful, expensive, and causing a tremendous amount mm. of, of distress among our patients. Are you it's, thinking of like incidentalomas, you know, where you image the person and there's stuff here, but it probably doesn't matter? Correct. So, so the incidentaloma story is very important. If you think of, of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, if you think of prostate cancer, if you think of some of the nodular lymphomas you find in women who get mastectomies, you finally find, sometimes find an incidental lymphoma in the removed lymph nodes. If you think of meningiomas, if you think of optic neuromas, adrenals, adrenal adenomas, thyroid nodules, the assumption that all of these will become cancer has proven to be wrong. There's a reason they never developed and they sat there long enough to be detected. And drawing distinction between these is going to be critical. It's, you know, back of the napkin calculations, almost 40% of the calls that we get are for incidental anomas. Mm. Um, and this represents a huge burdens on the finance of health care and exposes people to unnecessary morbidity. So what we need is monitoring tools, and we need tools that point to biology rather than point to, to sort of just mere presence. So as we've talked about, metastatic prostate cancer remains an incurable disease. And although lately there have been some very promising research into the development of a stress response therapy that targets aggressive prostate cancers, None of this research today has been translated into an effective therapy. So you addressed this issue um, back in 2018 in an article in Science Translational Medicine that was titled ER Stress and Prostate Cancer, a Therapeutically Exploitable Vulnerability. Your article was in response to a paper that also appeared in that same journal that was titled Development of a Stress Response Therapy Targeting Aggressive Prostate Cancer. So I have two questions for you. So first, what led you to write this response? And since 2018, when these two papers were published, has there been much progress in developing effective therapies that target these aggressive prostate cancers? So I'll answer the first question first, is that this notion that there is a rheostat in cancers where you dial in sensitivity. So proteotoxic stress means that many of the metabolites, many of the consequences of this malignant process or excess protein accumulation, and some of the benefits of our therapy are basically to increase this protein that results in cytotoxic death of the cell. So the noxious, for a better term, of excess protein accumulation could be exploited by increasing, you know, the vulnerability of protein accumulation in cells that were toxic forms of this protein. So it was a conceptual framework that was entirely different because it suggested there was an optimum and superoptimum dose and schedule of therapies that that would result in this proteotoxic stress. So this whole concept has created, again, this, this desire to thread the needle between effects and efficacy of therapy on the cancer and avoid excess toxicity on the host by optimizing the proteotoxic stress with our therapies and monitoring it. So that's, that's the general concept behind this, which again speaks to these notions of how do you treat men with prostate cancer that is now a lethal variant. And while it's correct that we don't cure men with metastatic disease, it has become a chronic disease. Almost 30% of men with metastatic, potentially lethal prostate cancer, metastatic, will die now of an unrelated cause of death. Now, it's hard to make the claim that somebody dying is a success, but if we didn't contribute to that, un- unnecess- that unrelated cause of death, we then kept people alive well enough so they could die of another disease. And since immortality is not an option, aligning these two age-related events is one of our goals. Again, let me emphasize, nearly 30% of men die from unrelated causes of death. So there is a rapid prolongation um, that of life of men with metastatic disease that is becoming very profound and requiring us to rethink how we approach these, these patients and accounting more for the side effects on patients because we don't want to increase the unrelated cause of death and declare victory because they died of something else possibly accelerated by us. One way of doing that is looking at um, a subset of patients who have highly aggressive prostate cancer, the, the lethal, what we call the aggressive variant, and that is a subset of these patients. And we now know that they're governed by the clonal expansion rather than adaptive systems. And this is led in, in our department by Anne Aparicio and some of her colleagues, Patrick Pelier, where we can now show that the loss of the retinoblastoma gene 
the alterations in P53 and P10, three tumor suppressors that are important in prostate cancer, are tightly associated with, and we believe initiate a set of events that drive this clonal expansion. Those patients now benefit from treatment approaches when recognized early that are typical of rapidly proliferating aggressive tumors not hormonally related. We now can detect them. There is a randomized trial that we performed that's now going to be an international randomized trial, or excuse me, a national randomized trial. We hope that'll, that'll actually introduce platinum-based therapies in PARP inhibitors in subset of patients where it's driven by this subset. So the answer is, in large phase two trials, even the most aggressive forms of this disease have, uh, are, are getting remarkable responses, and we're optimistic about them. That's why we shifted the term from lethal prostate cancer to aggressive prostate cancer, reflecting our hopefulness and promise of, of this. And I think the changes are, are very real. So prostate cancer is a highly heritable disease with disparities in incidence rates across ancestry populations. And just as an example, black men are 76% more likely to develop prostate cancer. The Prostate Cancer Foundation says that this is one of the largest health disparities in all of medicine. And I know this is definitely something that you've been investigating. So what can you tell us about this disparity? Yeah. So... It's a very, very complex problem, and that usually is introduction to, I don't know. But, but actually, one of the major problems we're shifting away from is this self-appointment of your race rather than the biological appointment is essential. Not all African Americans are equal. Many of them have mixed heritages. The Nigerian moving here, the Ghanaian moving here may be different than the African-American who's been in the Deep South. What we know is that there is a very tight correlation between some lifestyle behaviors and lethality of this disease. And what we don't know when you account for the heterogeneity of what gets encompassed as African-Americans, whether all of this is genetic based on race or, or within the individuals within this race. So the evolution to defining race by biology and genetics as opposed to just self-appointed social groups, which is another important aspect in lifestyle, is extremely important. The social studies of this will lead to understanding whether our structured limitations in providing them health economics, health economics, their mistrust and the ability of the healthcare system to engage these underserved populations is one dilemma. The genetics and the biology is another, and then the interaction between the two is a third. And until we, we sort of continue with the basics of science in developing these, I think we'll, we'll continue to challenge and not make the progress we should. There's been years of, of well-intended efforts to address this but reducing it to biology and staying with the principles of, of good science, I think, is going to be one of the, one of the keys of this. Hmm. I understand that there is a precision prostate cancer screening in development, sometimes or often called the Smith test. This sounds like something that could really help address many things, including the disparities in incident rates across ancestry populations. The test is described as a simple blood test, and... Uh, you know, I read it with great interest, sort of like a cholesterol test, and that could be used to indicate the lifetime risk of prostate cancer for any particular man. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? That seems really important if it, if it's, if it yeah. works as intended. So the goal of, of anticipatory medicine, I think, is real, and um, we need to think about that in, in a really important way. The problem with anticipatory medicine is the equivalent of the AUC of good survival. I know how to avoid prostate cancer. Do a prostatectomy on everybody when they become an adolescent. The answer is it's, it's unpalatable. So again, the utility statement comes on. In a disease whose prevalence increases and shows up at a median age of 68, have we helped people by identifying at age 30? And the answer is yes, if it's a lethal d disease that shows up at age 40 and the window of opportunity is small. But the majority of prostate cancers are not like that. They evolve over time. So the principle behind this, I think, is, is critical. But this, this utility statement in a disease that takes a long time to evolve will only be addressed with large tissue banks 
that we can deal with the issue of time. Because the other thing that's unacceptable is we find something and ask people to wait for two generations from now to prove that it works. Yeah. So the developing of these infrastructures and access to unique tissue banks and well-annotated data and the structure to do that will allow us to go back, detect if they're there, and find out if they actually point to a disease that is worthy of intervening early, which is a small subset of patients with prostate Mm. cancer. The key piece that will enable this is access to well-developed, well-annotated, readily accessible tissue banks. I can see that. And I can see the dilemma as well. If you... the, the dilemma is huge you, you, because we're asking people, wait wait to your great-grandchildren to, to, to intervene based on the data that we know and ignore them, or everybody get a prostatectomy. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I, I mean, it's not an exact analogy, but it's somewhat like the dilemma that physicians have counseling patients that find out they're APOE4, and most APOE4s don't develop Alzheimer's, but some do. And, it's, and what it, do you do with that? And and it and it's and it's in in women it's it's this issue of bilateral anticipatory mastectomies that are done in offspring of of women at very high yep. risk. And we now know that majority of them elect to get monitored closely to intervene rather than the or that's frequently happened. So so these are these are big challenges. Could could I go back to the issue of disparity? I, I'm sensitive about this. So it's a very laudable goal to address these disparities. We've done that for a long time, and we all support the disparities in healthcare. These disparities are widespread auto accident rates, cardiovascular disease, which is equally, you know, homicide rates, diabetes. Diabetes. So the question is how do we engage this as a society, which, which we must do, and only an aspect of this is biology? The aspect of this being biology is critical by asking biologically-based questions. It often gets mixed with these societal questions that have a huge overlay and interact with biology. And I don't think we have a structure yet that has successfully dealt with this. And it's, it's a laudable goal. It's one that we all support. But one's got a question with the serial failures in addressing this dilemma, where, whether we're approaching it in the right way. Chris, we've talked about the Prostate Cancer Foundation. We know that you've been active with the Prostate Cancer Foundation. It was established back in 1993, and since then, the death rate from prostate cancer has dropped more than 50%. So after listening to you today, it sounds as if we are on the verge of some major breakthroughs in therapies for prostate cancer. So what's on the horizon that gives you the most hope? Yeah, so so identifying the lethal subset of patients um, early on so we can provide them specific aggressive therapy and deal with the heterogeneity in that group, which we're able to do now in liquid biopsies. We're overcoming some of the challenges to immunotherapy um, with identifying the barriers to immunotherapy, which exist in bone and in other sites. These bispecific antibodies, which are very intriguing, where one component of the antibody attaches to the tumor cell and then randomly I don't believe it's random. There's nothing random in biology, but that's the assumption. (laughs) Brings lymphocytes to to the microenvironment, and that same lymphocyte, which is in circulation, has no effect, but when it's in close proximity, causes a remarkable toxic event, which is reversible, and remarkable anti-tumoral activities, Mm. which is consistent. We're dissecting out in the department, and that's led by a young investigator, Bilal Siddiqui, in our department, and, and other people are looking at this as well. And then the other arm is to actually identify those patients where prostate cancer is indicator of related events, metabolic syndrome that are co-associated with it or other vulnerabilities in a newly defined age-related syndrome where focusing on the prostate cancer gets you far removed from taking care of the patient and you have to globally take care of them as a more holistic problem. Identifying that subset will allow us to build on, focus on the problems of lethal prostate cancer and refocus our approach in a different way on on the other forms of prostate cancer, which require an integration of multiple disciplines to take care of these. That's on the verge of happening. And in fact, in our institution, it's happening. And we approach them in very different ways and in very different environments. For example, Patients are not served well by going to an intense tumor biology center where they endlessly focus on every small gene when the performance of that test, when the mortality is 1% at 15 years later, far exceeds anything that we can imagine. And having that be a dilutional effect on focusing on the other patients where that knowledge is critical 
in the same environment doesn't work. So we're actually moving those patients into an environment where other aspects of their health care get equal attention. And I, I suspect that that will prolong survival by appropriately focusing our attention. And there's low-hanging fruit in both of these domains to make an outcome. Mm, that was a great answer. So, Chris, a little later today, you're going to be giving an evening lecture here at IHMC that you've titled Addressing Paradoxes in Healthcare. So for decades now, you've been a fervent proponent of improving the translational research environment so that it aligns clinical care with research goals. Can you give our listeners a little preview of your talk? Sure. So, so the paradoxes are one, and, and we discussed this earlier in a brief meeting with Ken, was that randomized trials have moved us from purely an anecdotal empirical study to very objective scientific studies for population. But over time, they've gotten further and further away from meeting the needs of patients where the therapy is in a complex therapeutic environment. And yet the study of an individualized patient is hard and is not served well exclusively by taking data from, from randomized controlled trials. So one is this to try to, to sort of understand this paradox that what may be good for a population is not good for an individual and vice versa. And these are complementary approaches. The second paradox is we know that biology is live and it moves. Yet when we study it, we try to lo look at this whole movie, this whole reel of events by killing tumor cells, putting them in paraffin and staining them once and assuming that that will help us roll out what will happen to the cancer over time. And yet we now have technologies to monitor the space and movement and the cells interacting between themselves with intravital microscopy in vivo so, so we can actually understand evolution and movement over time, and these become key indicators. So we want to go to the complexity of cancer cells that look at movement over time rather than one static event to try to, which is going to depend hugely on AI and sharing data in some way that protects patients that we can develop these kind of concepts. The third um, big issue th that wanted to raise was this notion of studying cancer and studying cancer alone was good enough to actually improve the outcome of, of patients with this disease. And it's clear as this is evolving to a more chronic disease, we have to reassemble sort of what used to be in a rotating internship where we had enough of information about everything that we could be general contractors rather than subcontractors trying to manage the whole building of this house, that we could reassemble this data. So the strength of the subcontractors has made us great plumbers, great roof builders, great foundation builders, but somehow the whole house is lost in this. And yet the strengths of, of, of that focused approach is going to have to, to sort of be reassembled in a way I think by the intellectual crutch of AI and collecting data and exposing investigators to data in ways that can be ingested. There's a way to have too much data, and there's a way to have too little data, and there's a way to have data at the wrong time, and the decision maker in the clinic who partners with the patient needs the right data at the right time. And that is becoming a big problem. So the paradox is we've gotten more data, and we've made advances within these silos but we're not more than the sum of the parts yet. And it's reflected in our overall sort of national survival rates, which are not improving and, in fact, are reducing some. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And we see this uh, need to move from data to knowledge. Uh, we see it in hundreds of different fields and is particularly acute in medicine, I think. Yeah, well said. I agree. So as a note to our listeners, Chris's uh, lecture this evening will be videotaped, and by the time this STEM Talk interview goes live, his talk will be posted on IHMC's website, and it's also available, will be available on YouTube, and uh, I'm sure that'll have a, a large and interested audience. Now, Chris, as we mentioned earlier, you're nearing your 50th anniversary at MD Anderson. Is retirement on the horizon? That's the first question. And after talking to you today about all the work that you've done in the past couple of years, it certainly doesn't sound like it. So if not, what else are you planning to do? Yeah, so, so I think the notion of retirement for many of us is should be replaced with refocus appropriate to the knowledge we've gained. It sort of speaks to this notion of circle of life and and. I think this is critical because one of the other paradoxes that I'm not going to mention is healthcare providers talk about taking care of young people, right? 
because they have the most promise and they have many years for them. So saving a 10-year-old will provide them 60, 70 years of productive life ahead of them. But we don't save them so they can't sort of transmit their experiences over life to the next generation. We actually, one of the purposes we save them is so they can do that. And that's what causes this, their sort of contributes to this transgenerational knowledge that strengths in both our country and creates the legacy for all of us. So um, it may appear self-serving, but the knowledge gained over time is something that increasingly feeling need to exploit in a gift that I've been given by many people who have supported my research that is sort of an obligation I think none of us can avoid. And, and I would think that that's a very important societal question that we need to think about, how we gain from the experiences rather than sort of shut out the, these experiences that everybody has had that need to be transmitted to the next generation. Well, that used to be uh, part of the definition of an education was the transmission of culture. Correct. Right? That's right. Probably that's banned now, but uh, yeah. it, it, it was the classic definition. Yes, uh, yes. So a little birdie told me that after you've had a hard week of work, that someone you work with will tell you to go pet your boat. <laughs> uh, what's up with that? What, what is that about? Yeah, so... Um, if I weren't doing this, I'd be living on the water on some sailboat in some remote harbor somewhere. Um, it's, it's the place that I really gain a lot of inspiration. There's a wonderful book by Robert McFarland called The Old Ways. And um, I'm going to take a second to digress a little bit on this. So pre-World War I, when people used to go out and hike and move around, it was a dangerous thing to do. There weren't roads, there weren't maps and the like. And Barrows was one of the old sort of proponents of this. And, and it was not just the physical and strenuous activity of walking in the highlands of Scotland or the moors or the like, which was very dangerous at that time. But it required an exercise in, in observing and looking because that's what saved you. You didn't know where to walk. You knew when this, you didn't fall off a cliff. You knew how to anticipate the weather. So that was called walking. And it wasn't, it was very, very different than running a marathon on a path or physically and that sweet feeling of just being exhausted. That walking also trained your mind to, to, to have an open mind. And if you look at after World War II and most recently with, with the internet and iPhones and, and everything else, we're all reacting quickly and we're acting with one synapse to, to messages. And that's more like a marathon of data rather than the power of reflection and observation, which becomes very important. And the antidote to that for me has been this book and that notion. For me, for some people, it's, it's climbing mountains. Mm -hmm. For other people, it's going to sea. Um, but I'd really advise that you take a look at that book mm -hmm. because it, 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 it sort of emphasizes the power of having an open mind and looking. Wow, that's wonderful. I mean, as a society, we've become entirely reactive People react all day long to their emails and their phones, and there's almost no time. People don't take time. They don't preserve time for reflection. Correct. And it's a real loss. So we understand that you're such an avid sailor that you have a sailboat in Greece as well as Texas, and that you do some of your best work <laughs> on sailboats, which I could understand. Is that right? That's correct. That's wonderful. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today on STEM Talk. It's been fantastic speaking with you. We've learned a ton about the work that you're doing and are thankful for the work that you're doing. Well, I hope it's helpful and I hope uh, it's of value to somebody. Thanks, Chris. It was wonderful and we really appreciate you coming on. It's a privilege. STEM Talk. 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 So, Ken, both you and I know several people who have been to MD Anderson to receive treatment and care for various cancers. And it's definitely encouraging to listen to Chris talk about how much progress there has been in using chemotherapy drugs to treat various cancers. You're right, Don. Chris has played a significant role in developing effective therapies that target aggressive prostate cancers as well as many other kinds of cancer. For listeners who enjoyed today's interview and want to learn more about Chris's research, be sure to check out the video derived from his IHMC lecture. We will have a link to this video in our show notes. If you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. 
This is Don Conega signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.